last time we did uh, late antiquity before the fall. And today we're going to do uh, session two, Byzantium, Persia, and the West after the fall. So basically we're going to look at the period between 400 and the early 600s and what's going on in the world because it will determine what happens in uh, deeply into the Middle Ages as we proceed. So with that said, uh, and then next week we, we're gonna go straight to the rise of Islam and pick it up from there, uh, which will begin right in the, in the next, in the early 600s. So that said, uh, first some remarks about what happens to high culture in this period. The um, tussle between Christianity and classicism, which had been going on for centuries uh, because classical educational traditions and Christian educational traditions were very much opposed in the beginning. And th that opposition expressed itself in the classic of uh, faith versus uh, reason tension. Early Christians had adopted a defensive position against classical literature and culture. Uh, they really thought it, it uh, defied the requisites of faith to reduce every all all knowing to uh, to ratiocination to scientific reason simply and logic. Uh, classicism was considered either as heresy, uh, as in the case of Neoplatonic philosophy, or or mere paganism, as in the case of Latin poetry, depending what people were reading. Uh, by according to Christian writers. But the basis for all higher education in the ancient world was the traditional curriculum of the seven liberal arts. The group of three called the trivium, from which we get trivia, and the group of four, the quadrivium. The trivium was the um, set of literary studies that, that began with uh, grammar, moved to logic, and then ended in the, the grand study of um, rhetoric. And the quadrivium were the, the mathematicals. It was math itself, uh, geometry, astronomy, and music, because people regarded that as having mathematically predictable um, relationships internally. And this was true for all early Christian theologians as well. They studied the traditional or classical curriculum. So the question then became, what are we going to do? How do we reconcile our faith with this tradition of science and knowledge that we have inherited? With the cultural dominance of Christianity after Constantine, the defensive posture faded because now Christianity was in the driver's seat. They weren't being criticized from outside. They weren't being threatened from a distance. The solution provided by the great theologians of the fourth century, and, and I name here Saints Augustine, Ambrose, and Jerome, all of which are uh, Latin-based theologians, even though Jerome uh, had, who was the translator of the Vulgate edition of the Bible, uh, really was also Greek and Hebrew speaking as well. But Augustine is, is the man that we will look towards because they were going to apply the techniques of classicism to sacred texts, both Augustine and Jerome in particular. They were going to take the tools that they had learned from their studies of rhetoric and logic. And they were going to apply those techniques to sacred texts, to biblical texts. And what was at stake was the idea of what it meant to interpret. And you see in this large box in the slide um, that I've named interpretation, accepting 
naive biblical stories. And remember, they, the earliest stories in the Old Testament, uh, or if you take uh, non-Christian, Judeo-Christian texts, you know, the Epic of Gilgamesh or what have you, they were really uh, constructed by people who lived in societies that, that we would see as naive. The whole tradition of elaborating uh, a critical sensibility hadn't, hadn't developed yet. So this accepting of naive biblical stories as literally true, uh, which was an issue for brilliant intellectuals like Augustine, was daunting. What are we to do with this? Sacred texts, however, could still be regarded, as Augustine pointed out, as true by seeing them as figurative or allegorical and in need of interpretation. So if you say God, God's word is still tr in the text, uh, God is speaking through the text, but he's not doing it in a naive way. He's giving us, he's given us these tools so that we can correctly interpret the figures, the allegories, uh, the metaphors uh, embedded in the text to get at the truth. The skills of text criticism central to the classical curriculum had a place. And I, I throw in a quote from Augustine here, we must be on our guard against giving interpretations which are hazardous or opposed to science. And so exposing the word of God to the ridicule of unbelievers. Augustine um, was quite clear about this. He says in other places, if you find a contradiction between what science and reason dictate and what the surface level of the text says, then one of a couple of things is possible. You have either there, there could be a fault in your reasoning, or the sacred text itself could be figurative and in need of further interpretation. So keep digging and, and we'll see what you come up with. Uh, I, I throw in this, this uh, fresco from the Lateran Palace in the lower right uh, because it shows Augustine with text and it's the earliest known portrait uh, visual portrait of Augustine in uh, the West, in art, period. And you find this in Rome, if you, go, if you go digging. Now, what's going to happen? This high culture that had been developed and had now been Christianized, the curriculum had been, uh, in the fourth century, turned into this tool for the church as it had been a tool for classical paganism, is going to narrow. With the fall of the West, high culture is going to narrow, by which I mean not that it, it's going to be dumbed down, but simply that there are going to be fewer people with access to it. So the social base of high culture is going to get skinny in this period. Civic institutions had been barbarized in the collapse of urban society. So the newly arrived Germans, like the Ostrogoths, may have admired Romanitas or not, depending who we're speaking of. Certainly not the Franks or the Lombards, as we'll discuss later on, but the Ostrogoths did admire Romanitas, but they weren't particularly equipped to support high literacy. Their social classes are largely restricted to warrior and serf. They're running around with their gefolgas, their comitatus, um, banging on people's heads and, and, and uh, trying to, to dominate new territories. The Latin spoken by Germans is at best a pigeon Latin, uh, sort of a, a military camp Latin that will eventually develop into the local Romance vernaculars. And, and we know what the Romance languages are, but if there are, and I believe, what could we say now? There are 
five dominant ones and a couple of minor ones like Ladino in the Alps. But beyond those, in, in the 8th and 9th century, even into the 11th and 12th centuries, there were probably, in Spain, there, there must have been 10 or 15 different versions of Romanche, as they would have called it at the time. Uh, dialects of, of Latin that grew out of Germans mixing with uh, the local Latin speakers in a dumbed down social hierarchy, trying to do their best with a language that was not native to them. Now, the old aristocracy, as we pointed out last time, increasingly gravitate to the church as their haven. So the social chaos of the invasions makes the church an opportunity, a haven. The classical curriculum is acceptable as a Christian discipline. And so what we find then, that third bullet there, is a movement from the focus on the secular in the curriculum to the sacred for two reasons. The curriculum has moved to sacred texts, A, but the people who knew the curriculum have moved from the senatorial class and become bishops or abbots, and they've moved into the church. And, and with this movement, you can explain much of what's going to happen with intellectual life in the West, at least, over the next three or four centuries. The content of high literacy in this period tends to be, uh, tends to religious subjects and becomes progressively either theological on one hand or devotional. Devotional sort of uh, discussion of morality and of the heart and, and how you truly turn your conversio morum, your change of ways, from the dark side to, to, to Christ and the light side. Books become holy objects. The reason they are illuminated and had never been illuminated in the Roman period or in, in the Greco-Roman period, if you will, is that they are now sacred objects. And they are sacred, sacred objects that are there to impress, they're there to give glory to God, they're there to be treated as holy objects, and they're there to impress the illiterate with the pictures. I know this is special, I can't read a word, but God is it beautiful. And, and, and as you know, and we'll see a lot of manuscript as we go on in, in this uh, course, uh, a lot of it is done in, in gold trim and the like, uh, God's own metal, if you will. The range of intellectual topics narrows as classical secular literature is pushed to the back stacks of church libraries. Now, as an aside, if we jump a thousand years later, there are going to be Renaissance scholars who are combing, they're, get, they're getting permission. Uh, usually they, they have the blessing of the church. They're combing the libraries of the great abbeys of Italy, Germany, and France, looking for books in the back stacks because they're trying to recapture the lost classical literature of Rome. And they know that the monks of the last several centuries haven't been particularly tuned into those books. They won't even know they're there. So Lucretius's uh, great scientific poem, uh, his materialist poem, uh, De Rerum Natura, maybe the greatest single work of the Roman classical period, maybe not, but maybe some would argue, had been lost to the West and, until uh, Poggio Bracciolini, a, a papal scribe, 
cons his way into a Benedictine abbey in Germany and discovers it, knows what he has found, knows the monks aren't going to let him take it, and stays in there for a couple of months copying the entire 12,000-line poem down on his own so he can sneak it out of the abbey and, and Western civilization can have it again. So monasteries then become havens of Romanitas. High culture exists, but it has escaped into the monasteries. And I have a little picture here of a scriptorium. Uh, monks copying texts so that they can pass them from abbey to abbey, which was the the major way that they stayed alive. So the only bastions of literate Latin are some few bishops' palaces, which cater to the old nobility, and the mushrooming monasteries of the West, which we will talk about very soon. So to preserve and share books, and by the way, this is the period in which the codex form, the book as we know it, not the manuscript, not the scroll, but the the, the folded out book, as we think of it, the paginated book was developed. Monks copied texts or created excerpted epitomies, digests, and handbooks. So often what they did, if they thought, it was very common in this period to say, I want to find uh, all the great commentary on the sin of greed and they would comb through all books of the saints and philosophical discussions. And anytime they found, it was like Wikipedia. Anytime they, they found an allusion to that, they copy it into their epitome or their digest or their handbook. And so much of what we're left, and, and in fact, there are writers, Roman, ancient Roman writers that we only know in excerpted form because some monk decided to include them in a digest and because we've lost the source book itself. So the scriptorium, the, the writing room, was an essential mission of all Western monasteries. For the next five centuries, 90% of all literate people are in monasteries or have come through monasteries. And, and the 10% who aren't are probably member, members of, of some aristocracy or another. So uh, a, a little uh, back story on monasticism proper. Uh, it's the ascetic movement, just to create the picture first before we can talk about medieval monasticism. It's an, the ascetic tradition that develops first in Egypt and Syria. Men of fire, servants of God, living martyrs, holy men go off to, to what they describe as the desert, whether it was the desert or not. Usually it meant they left towns. They, they left urban centers. They got away from people. They displaced. They removed themselves. They secluded themselves. They were hermits. So... Anchorites are the types of monks called, that we now call hermits. Anchoresis means displacement or removal. And the first father of the movement, Anthony of the Desert in Egypt, led to extreme versions um, such as um, the stylites, the, the, the sitters, the... Um, pillar sitters who themselves, oh, I jumped myself here, oh, pardon my screen. The pillar sitters who removed themselves from cities and then sat on top of erected pillars. People would come to be near holy people. They'd make donations of bread and the like. And these guys would sit in isolation for 20 or 30 years. So here's an icon showing the two simian stylites, the elder and the younger, on top of their pillars. Um, I don't think anybody's doing this uh, these days, unless it's Elon Musk. And it's not 
something that was even done much in the ancient world, but it created the image of the holy man or holy woman as in a figure who could intercede, an intermediary. They had power, they had access to God, they could stand between the lesser person and the God. They, because they had, I, I, I highlighted this term, parhesia, a freedom to speak before the majesty of God. And so, and by the way, in the Middle Ages, as the social gap between serf and lord widens, the idea of an intermediary class of holy person becomes even, even more important. But it's born into monasticism at the very beginning. Eastern monasticism, the Greek and Syrian and Egyptian forms, eventually develop communal settings. Cenobites are monks who live in community, not as hermits. And that they, these communities, live according to formal rules, regula, as they would be called in Latin. Uh, so within the Orthodox Church or the Catholic Church, if somebody refers to priests as regular, uh, that doesn't mean regular as, as we normally mean in, in English. Like it's not plain pizza as opposed to pizza with a topping. Reg, regular means a, a monk or a nun who lives according to a group rule. And so uh, St. Basil, and, and John Cashin, the Egyptian, write rules for monks to live by. Th these rules are imported into the West. And I have a little map down here that, that shows green lines moving westward. And, and abbeys, all those little dots are abbeys that were founded either in North Africa or in Italy or in Visigothic Spain, or they make it into Gaul. Uh, but the key figure, uh, heavily influenced by John Cashin, is Benedict of Nur Nursia, an early 6th century uh, Roman from a, an aristocratic family who goes off, founds an abbey in Monte Cassino. You may have passed it as you drive from Rome to Naples. Benedictine abbeys are always built on mountaintops. Uh, he was, Norcia, by the way, is the modern Norcia on the border between Umbria and the Marche, famous for, uh, for smoked hams, if you will. So if you're, if you're in the market for delicatessen, it's a nice place to, to drive through. Anyhow, influenced by Cashin, he writes his famous Regula Sancti Benedicti, the rule of St. Benedict with an emphasis on balance, moderation, and reasonableness. He tries to take the harshness out of, um, out of monasticism because it's got to be uh, an invitation to more people now in the West as the world has collapsed around them. He realizes it's going to be a, a major institution at this point. And, and he wants a place that can handle not just extreme self-sacrificing types, but more generally um, the, the, uh, the people that would find a refuge there. Um, hey, from Kenny Bronkowitz, the monastic, monastic schools incorporated religious studies, Trivium Quadrivium, you're correct. They are the early universities. And it's something that we'll talk about as we get further into the class as well. Uh, so we have from Benedict the quote, we have therefore to establish a school of the Lord's service and the institution of which we hope we are going to establish nothing harsh, nothing burdensome. And the great Benedictine Pope, Gregory I, um, who 
is born as Benedict dies, so he's two generations younger. With the social and political upheaval of the West, the papacy begins to assume leadership for religious and cultural preservation. The papacy, as we're going to see in Italy particularly, is, is left holding the, the, the role of leadership uh, in the, the political vacuum introduced by the German invasions. So Gregory is a former monk. He enlists the monastic movement as the primary tool in converting the Germans. Let's use monks another way, not just as preservers of culture, let's use them as missionaries. And they will be the great um, movers and shakers uh, for the next couple of hundred years in the effort to turn Germans from pagan druids into something recognizable as Christians. Even though a, a Christian king like Clovis of the Franks uh, might adopt Catholicism does not mean that it was in any sense a Christian sensibility. This is a politically opportune gesture done by a, uh, a German pagan who is going to, to do it for uh, dynastic reasons. And the real conversion work is something that's gonna happen subsequent to the conversion of and the baptism of the leaders. But again, we'll talk more about that. Now, the relationship of Christianity and paganism, whoop, let me get ahead of myself, is basically Christianity had worked out its differences with ancient Greco-Roman paganism because basically that paganism had moved towards monotheism anyhow. The more educated of them, even when, by the fifth century, fourth century, fifth century, were monotheists of sorts. They thought there was a great God. But now with the German invasions, Christianity is confronting a new form of paganism. Not that it's new, but uh, new to the problem of conversion. It's animism. It's really the primitive uh, religious impulse that you find all over the ancient world that ascribes power and life to totems, to animals, to plants, to rocks, to rivers, to locations, to human artifacts. Cultic rituals, sacrifices, pre priesthoods evolved to tap their power. I show from the ancient Greek world, a herm. Uh, it's a fertility, you see even a phallus on. They were all, sometimes they were just, they originally began as piles of rocks at crossroads. So the herms are both uh, fertility symbols in the ancient Greek world, as well as boundary markers and property markers and the like. And, and the Germans and Celts who'd moved into the empire bring this kind of uh, very primitive cultural uh, ritual and, and sacrifice propensity to bear in the sixth and seventh century. German paganism venerated lots of uh, natural objects, sacred trees, Thor's oak, famously cut down by the monk St. Boniface uh, Winfred, the English monk who goes to, to uh, convert the Germans, the Saxons in the eighth century. Uh, and from Willibald's Life of Boniface, a quotation, moreover, some were once secretly, some openly to sacrifice to trees and springs, some in secret, others openly practiced inspections of victims and divinations, ledger domain and incantations. Some turned their attention to auguries and auspices and various sacrificial rites. So German folklore, Teutonic folklore at large, you still find this in England into the 18th century and 19th century is filled with people who have access to the power in objects and, and rituals they're magicians, they're shamans, they're witches, they're cunning men. Um, they're, 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 they're people who are able to tap into the occult 
uh, you you find that these traditions uh, have an an a undercover through the entire Renaissance magical traditions all the way up through the 18th century. Now, the idea of a Christian sacrament, the Christian sacraments, which are, if I use the Catholic or Orthodox Church's definition of it, it's a sacred ritual uh, that conveys grace, but that has an outward sign or a visible symbol, baptismal water, the Eucharistic bread, etc. The sacrament is the holy act. It's the conveyance of grace, but it always has this physical um, representation. If you can imagine how a culture rooted in animism responds to the idea of a sacrament. For theologically unsophisticated minds, sacrament literally in Latin means a sacred thing, a holy thing, a sacramentum. It's easily perceived as the sort of holy thing found in animist practice. And so the cult of relics that we're going to see in the Middle Ages, that we begin to, to see right from this period on, a splinter of the true cross, the, the, the bones of St. Corbinian, and this little uh, image on the lower right, the translation, meaning the, the movement of, of the body, the, the leftover bones of the St. Corbinian, transferred by monks from one location to another. Religion among the new German converts, and by extension, almost all peasants in, in uh, Western Europe in this period, was, was profoundly a mix of paganism and Christianity. The holy was reified, it was turned into a thing, body parts, the property of saints. Monks were used as missionaries to try to complete the process of Christianization. And, and on one hand, they're trying to introduce a level of sophistication uh, that would deny this kind of primitive regard of relics. But at the same time, relics were the most present and obvious tools that they could use uh, in communicating religious concepts to the people that they were addressing. And so um, a slide of relics. We have the heart of St. Camillus. We have the hair and fingernails of St. Clair. We have the skull of Mary Magdalene. We have the blood of San Gennaro that liquefies uh, in Naples every year, or doesn't. If it doesn't, there's big trouble. If, if it does, we're okay. There's the arm from a much later period. There's the arm of Francis Xavier, the great uh, Jesuit saint. Uh, the veneration of these objects, which, of course, uh, is going to look very pagan, to outsiders, of course, needed to be theologically defended. And, and we see in, the, in these terms that I have listed here under the word intercession, uh, in, in Roman Catholic theology, for instance, they, they made devotion uh, of different types, categories. So Latria, using Greek words, by the way, but Latria, worship due to God directly. But then there was hyperdulia, which was an appeal for intercession to the very special person poised between normal people and God, and that is the Virgin Mary, who is the only person not, who doesn't participate in Godhead who is uh, born without sin, 
right? The Immaculate Conception is not Christ being immaculately conceived, it's Mary being immaculately conceived. So hyperdulia is a special category for appeal to her intercession. And then simply dulia, for, um, which is an appeal for intercession to a saint. So the, the church, in effect, had to make acceptable what could look from the outside as something uh, spectacularly pagan, if you didn't have a good explanation for it. And then I just had to throw in a, a procession, and this is uh, the true cross or some piece of it being paraded across the Piazza San Marco in a Gentile Bellini a Renaissance picture, which is just here. I can probably, if you'd like, you know, when I send out the PDFs, you get these pictures all in close up, but it's really a spectacular. Um, I wonder if they still do that procession, who knows. Uh, a comment on intercession, it's a social act. I'm asking somebody else to pray for me. And it reflects the hierarchy and the strata of medieval society. The liege lord is unapproachable. Therefore, I need somebody who's got an inn at City Hall. And I mentioned in a note at the bottom of the page, in the 8th century, we have, um, for the really for the first time, mass being said by priests whose backs are to the congregants. They're intercessors now. They're not facing the congregants. They're facing God as the representative of the congregant, as they face the altar with their backs to the congregation. Byzantium. So the Eastern Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, which still calls itself Rome, but we will now, as the West has fallen out of it, start calling Byzantium for Byzantium, the city of Constantinople. And if I give us a better image of, at, in 476, at the, at the point that there are Ostrogoths in Italy and the Western Empire uh, has folded, this is really what uh, the Eastern Empire looks like at that point in time. It's urbanized, it's populous, as we talked about last week. It's wealthy, certainly by comparison. It's multi-ethnic and it's polyglot. It speaks lots of different languages. It speaks Coptic and Syriac and Aramaic and, and, and uh, different dialects of Greek and Armenian and, and Slavic in places. Um, it's able to absorb and assimilate German Slavs, Armenians and others into the empire uh, when it lets them in. It's able to deflect the Goths and Huns through diplomacy and, and as, as it does in many cases, just out and out bribery and by the hiring and use of military mercenaries. It hires whole tribes of Germans and Slavs and Avars to defend the Northern border. Uh, it taxes very heavily in the provinces, which means that uh, in Syria and in Egypt, coming down through the lower parts of the empire, uh, there's going to be no love lost for Constantinople. Uh, and its cultural elite has survived. No need to run off into monasteries. Traditional scholarship continues throughout the medieval period. Uh, and something I'll mention as we get further on into it, uh, it its cultural survival is very preservationist in spirit. You don't get a lot of... Uh, new and vibrant philosophy, for instance, coming out of the Byzantine world uh, 
as we will see, they're going to be so put upon to survive the onslaughts from every direction that their culture becomes very internal facing and preservation becomes the, the cultural tradition. They want to maintain all the old forms of literacy and they're spectacular at it, but they don't produce nearly as much novel thought as we will see coming out of the Muslim world, for instance. So they have an expanded civilian bureaucracy. The talent pool uh, is taken from a very prosperous provincial base. Eunuchs assume leading roles at the court, the imperial administration, and the army. Much is made in Byzantine literature of the intrigue surrounding eunuchs who were in positions of great influence as court chamberlains. And we'll get a chance to look at some of that. The imperial cult and style of the Byzantine world uh, is uh, very much at, indebted to the fact that the church and the political world were, were overlapped in the tradition that I call down here Caesaropapism, as it's historians call it, meaning that the emperor will often claim in this period, not only, it's not accepted as the orthodox position, but he'll claim to be the head of the church, take it out of the hands of the, of, of the patriarchs, uh, especially now that the pope is out there in Rome living among the barbarian Goths, uh, the emperor the sole remaining emperor will claim to be the head of the church. And so, uh, yeah, and you see in this icon from Constantine and the patriarchs at the Council of Nicaea, uh, the patriarchs and the emperor all dressed in regal clothing. It's an imperial style. It's the cult of the emperor and the cult of the church tend to be the same cult. Christ, when represented in the Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox world is almost universally depicted as imperial. And I devote a slide to this. Byzantium and the imperial Christ. The, what you find at the dome of every church that's going to be built in the Byzantine world or the part of the world influenced by Byzantium is, is Christ as the creator of the universe, not the son of God in a human sense, but, but the creator of the universe, the, uh, the, the son of God who is part of the Trinity that creates everything, the Pantocrator, the creator of all. And this is because there's been a heavy monophysite influence. Remember, we talked about this last week in Egypt and those debates over the nature of Christ, the Egyptians were arguing and it had, uh, it, 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 it had great purchase in the ancient world. They argued that Christ's two natures were a it really one nature that was transformed. It was a new half divine, half human nature. And, and you get that sense when you look at, for instance, the apse of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, uh, this idea of, of, of Christ as, as something more than man. It's Christ in glory and majesty and power. Now, the Council of Chalcedon that the West hangs its hat on later on stresses the human nature of Christ as well. But you, you, you don't see it so much in the iconography of the Eastern Church. Uh, not the suffering Christ that you're going to get in Western medieval art. I throw in on the lower right this Dutch uh, devotional icon of the man of sorrows, Christ uh, in pain, the, the, who's just walked the Via Dolorosa, Christ in agony, uh, Christ the sacrifice, 
at the altar, as opposed to the icon from uh, uh, this mosaic from the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. This is not the Christ in pain. This is the Pantocrator. This is the Christ in glory. This is the creative father. Um, one of the signatures becomes and and uh, the, the 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 painted icons. We're going to talk about icons a lot, and in, in the very the sixth and last session of this series. But these painted icons, these very early ones from the uh, a monastery, Saint Catherine's Monastery in Sinai, become models of of a Byzantine devotion really for the next 15 centuries. This, this icon of, of Christ becomes the model for half of Christian art, I think. And Mary, of course, as we see here, is depicted in these early icons. She's known, by the way, in the Greek church as the Theotokos. She is the bearer of God. She's not the mother of Christ. She's the mother of God, the bearer of God. Her son is both God and man, divine and human. She had to be immaculately conceived. So early on, we get the veneration of icons in the, in the Orthodox Church. And we're going to see that there's a political war over this uh, in the 8th century, in the so-called iconoclast. Uh, controversy, but we'll get to that when we get to that. So, but we get this identification in Byzantium of the imperial with the ecclesiastical, with uh, the, the church itself. Um, moving along, here, let me... Somebody asked about, um, Peggy asked about what do the, um, the halos, let's go back a second, uh, holiness. So anyone who's been sainted, special to God, uh, the aura of light in, in, in much of church theology, much church theology in this period was based on a version of Platonism uh, called Neoplatonism or Neoplatonic philosophy, uh, the, the most famous Christian version of which is St. Augustine's, which will dominate Orthodox and Catholic theology for the next millennium, uh, sees grace as it sees knowledge expressed inside out, not outside in. You don't come to truth through the senses. You come to truth by understanding seeds that were planted inside you and in, and in Christian theology divinely from the beginning. And grace is seen as uh, working inside out and the physical representation of those on whom grace has worked is the corona, the aura, the radiation of, of the radiance of the holy. Anyhow, whoop, I jumped ahead of myself. There we go. So we come to Justinian, a um, Justinian the Great, the first of the great Byzantine emperors. Um, I call him here a man on the make. He's born in what would now be probably Croatia. He's the son of Latin speaking peasants of all things. He achieves high offices, the imperial court. He's adopted by the emperor. emperor. He becomes a regent and he succeeds to the throne in 527 CE or AD. He is called the emperor who never sleeps. He revises all Roman law. His corpus juris uh, civilis is the foundation of all European law, continental law, as opposed to English common law. 
um, going forward. It gets renovated in the Byzantine world and, and, and further amplified in the 17th century. Uh, he attempts to restore the Roman Empire to the West, the Renovatio Imperii. He goes to war with Sassanid Persia. He conquers Vandal North Africa, where the Vandals who had invaded the empire had settled. And he fights two incredibly costly wars in Italy against the Ostrogothic kingdom of Theodoric. Great tracts of the West are recovered uh, because of the services of two gifted military commanders. And here from the mosaics in San Vitale, we have Justinian and the people who are immediately to his, on his right hand, uh, as we face him facing left is Belisarius, and, and on his right is the eunuch Narcissus, who were the great generals who led victorious campaigns in Southern Italy and in North Africa against Gothic elements and Vandalic elements. And they do recapture much of it at a cost. Uh, he is a proponent for religious orthodoxy. He strongly suppresses heresies. He condemns monophysitism and tries to force unity of belief throughout the empire, thereby aggressively alienating all the provincials of Egypt, Syria, and Palestine because of this sort of heavy-handed shoving of theology in their faces. And remember what I said in the last session about the way political distinction was expressed through theology and religion in, in, in this period of the world, of history. And, and so basically he was making a political as well as a religious heavy-handed statement. Uh, he is a patron of the arts and architecture. The Hagia Sophia gets begun in his reign. Um, he builds San Vitale in Ravenna as, as it's recaptured uh, from the Goths and the great palace of Constantinople. Uh, part of his heavy handedness with Christian orthodoxy is that the various academies, the intellectual centers, uh, I talk about the Alexandrian school, uh, Jewish and Christian theology, mysticism, and Neoplatonism. During the early Christian era, era, Alexandria had become a center for a syncretic mix of Greek philosophy and various religious and mystical ideas. All of this stuff is going to start moving east because they're going to feel like they're getting squeezed by Justinian's policies. The Athenian Academy, founded by Plato, which at this point in time is a thousand years old, uh, is closed down by Justinian in the year 529. And so in Nestorian, Christian locations. Remember the, the Nestorian brand of Christianity that I said had dominated in places like Antioch and Edessa? Well, it, it has also become fairly entrenched in cities through what is Persia. The Sassanid Empire has these Christian settlements. The Persians were, were quite eclectic and tolerant of, of, of all kinds of other religions. They're, they're basically Zoroastrians, but it's not, it's not a very exclusionary religion. And, and this uh, closing down on non-Orthodox intellectual positions tends to uh, put a damper on those traditions 
within the empire, but it certainly has, has given impetus to some of them moving into uh, arenas where they have a better reception. The, so uh, a, a quote from John Malala, Samana Fiza Chronicler, the emperor issued a decree and sent it to Athens ordering that no one should teach philosophy nor astrology and outlaw divination with dice. Okay. So as Nestorian Christianity spreads eastwards into Persia, India, and China, academies versed in Greek thought are established there. So there's a lot of Jewish and Christian uh, intellectual activity going on throughout the Persian world. The schools, these schools work, and, and, and this is something I'm going to point out. Has, in fact, I'm going to show you this map again for another reason later on in, in the course. Uh, these the schools work in various languages based on where they are. So Greek, Persian, Aramaic, and Syriac are all languages used at different locations in these places. And by, you know, so you have Aramaic and Syriac speaking Jews. Uh, you will have Persianized Christians. You will have Greek being known at least as a second intellectual language, even if they're not speaking the Demotic Greek of the empire itself, mainly because after Alexander had Hellenized this part of the world, Greek literature was the only literature in the early ancient world that, that wasn't, let's say, Chinese, um, that in this part of the world that could be called the literature. And therefore, Greek beget, had this very honored place as the language of the curriculum that then gets translated into other languages as we go, as we will see. But it was still a language that people in the Roman world, for instance, thought any educated person had to know. So if an Englishman in 1830, an English gentleman thought he should know French to be thought educated, a Roman thought, and, and my guess is a, uh, some Persians thought, and certainly Syrians and uh, Egyptians thought Greek was a language that they had to know to be thought as educated. So as the West loses its access to classical thought and texts, the East widens its access. So as, as, as cultural literature and art narrows in the West, it migrates in the East and is available, if you will, in more places. So war and plague. This is Justinian's, I've got a map here of, Justinian's reconquest. Um, so in the five, in the here, let me, there we go, make it a little larger for you. So in the 530s to 550s, there's success in North Africa, um, in Italy, and parts of Spain, and the islands. Uh, in the 540s, he, they have to keep the northern borders uh, defended from Avar Slavs and Bulgars. And there are Turkic and Persian penetrations into Syria while the armies are in the West. Uh, the Persian Empire is going to use its opportunities to start threatening the East Coast. So basically, what Justinian has done in trying to re-establish the Western Empire is he's created wars on several fronts. So it has an immense cost. And not simply because of the wars, but there is a serious depopulation that takes place. Perhaps the greatest period of bubonic plague greater than the Black Death of the 14th century, 
perhaps, devastating the entire Mediterranean in the beginning of the 540s, and outbreaks will continue to 750, during which two-century period, it's estimated that 40 to 50 million people died. And we have this quote from Procopius, who's the great historian of the Byzantine Empire of Justinian and his wife Theodora. During these times, there was a pestilence by which the whole human race came near to being annihilated. So in, from 540 to 562, Khusro the I, the Shah of Sassanid Persia, pressures um, the eastern borders. The consequences of Justinian's reign, exhaustion of military and financial resources, weak and tenuous control of the West. Italy is devastated and in chaos. A coherent, well-governed, pro-Roman, Ostrogothic kingdom will not be able to resist the incursion of another German tribe, the far less civilized and Romanized Lombards. So basically, because the empire and the Roman Latin elite could not accept Theodoric, the Arians' Ostrogothic presence in Italy, this, this war to overthrow them succeeds, and we're going to have the way paved for a much more barbaric group, the Lombards, to move into the vacuum. In the East, the heavily taxed, religiously dominated and disaffected Italian citizenry, Eastern citizenry. When Arab armies arrive in the seventh century, provincial subjects of the empire from Syria across the entirety of North Africa are complacently receptive. So if the question gets asked, how did really non, not large Arab armies storm across all of North Africa in a, in a matter of some decades? It was simply because the locals didn't particularly care. There was very little love lost for the uh, overlordship of the Byzantine world. Uh, since I mentioned Justinian as the um, patron of the arts and architecture, I decided to use not the Hagia Sophia, but San Vitale in Ravenna on the east coast of, of uh, Italy. If you've never been to Ravenna, this is one of the buildings in the world that should not be missed. It's small. Here's a picture of... of uh, the outside, this is the ground plan. It's begun under the Ostrogoths. It combines traditional Roman ele elements like the dome, but with Byzantine elements like the octagonal footprint and mosaics. So, you know, we get this, you, you see what an astonishing uh, interior this is. The apse, here's a uh, close-up of the apse itself. So we have uh, God and angels. Let us move along. Here we have the panels, the great panels of Justinian with Belisarius Narcissus and, and uh, the rest of his entourage. And I point out that the Justinian becomes the model of kingship in the Middle Ages as the leader of church and state. And you notice he's got churchmen and soldiers side by side. It's a statement. He's the heir of Constantine. He's the patron of art and architecture, but he is the uh, representative of the military, the state, and of the church. And down here, whoop, I didn't mean to get get ahead of myself. I meant to, oh, I can't get this right. Let me blow this up a little bit. And here's Theodora, the former prostitute 
who's his wife, the most beautiful woman in Constantinople with her entourage in the mosaics of San Vitale. And I have one mosaic here from the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople because it puts the two great models for medieval kingship, Justinian and Constantine, into the, a, a singular panel, the Virgin with the child, and you have Justinian donating the Hagia Sophia, and you have Constantine over here making the donation of uh, Constantinople itself. You have the walls of the city being offered uh, to Mary and Christ. The Lombards, or sometimes called the Longobards, uh, they migrate from Scandinavia to Germany uh, much more recently than Goths and some of the and Franks and some of the others had done, uh, and they consolidate power over several other German, Celtic, Turkic, and Slavic tribes, all way north of the border. Unlike the Ostrogoths, they had little previous contact with the empire and are barbarian to the core, barbaros. They are far into the core. They haven't been Romanized. They're largely pagan on arrival. In the 560s, in the, in this, into this devastated Italian peninsula, plague-ridden, war-torn, remnant hulk, they enter, they establish a kingdom of Italy, um, more or less the Regno Metallicum, but they do it as a series of duchies. The Lombard duchies, so in Northern Italy, they're centered on, on uh, Pavia up oh, here. I'll show us the map in a minute. Pavia is uh, over here in Northwest Italy near Turin. Uh, which would later fall to Charlemagne. And the duchies in Southern Italy are gonna remain intact until the 11th century when the Normans in Sicily appear on the scene. Uh, so, and, and when Saracens, Arabs uh, make their appearance as well. From 600 to 1100, Southern Italy would be claimed by Lombard dukes, the Byzantine and Carolingian empires, Sicilian Arabs and Normans. Uh, the Lombards themselves base their aristocracy in central cities, Milan, Pavia, Bergamo, Brescia. And I wanna, we'll go look at this map again in a second. I wanna point out much of the regionalism an urban parochialism of subsequent history in, in Italy may be attributed to the loose organization and independence of the 36 Lombard duchies. So through much of the Middle Ages, all these places, the Duchy of Spoleto, the Duchy of Benevento, the, um, the, the, the Northern duchies, Lombardia, uh, these places, all had local senses of themselves. And, it, and, and, and since Italian unification doesn't really occur until the 19th century, uh, this carries all the way into the 19th century, all through the middle medieval period. Even if there's a Spanish overlord in Naples, even if there's a French overlord in Naples, even if there are Norman dukes in, in Palermo, um, these places see themselves as central. So by the time we get to 600, these yellow tips down here are and remain for a long time part of the Byzantine Empire. You still find villages and small towns in these areas whose native dialect is not a dialect of Italian or Latin, but is a dialect of Greek, uh, true of Sicily also. And so in this period, this is um, the Byzantine Empire and the Exarchate of Ravenna is controlled by the Byzantines. This will later on become under 
Uh, the Carolingians, we'll see, these will become the Papal States. And of course, they control parts of Istria, which will be controlled by Venice in a number of centuries. But we will see all of this when we get to it. Anyhow, uh, the final couple of slides that I want to use today, the wars between Byzantium and Persia, which take place between 602 and 628. And they have tremendous significance uh, for what is to follow. But I won't mention that quite yet. So we see the Byzantine Empire. You still have Visigoths here, Lombards have moved in, Franks here, Bulgars and Avars up, up there. The Byzantines have had some success in wars between the 570s and 590s and captured part of the Caucasus, recaptured part of the Caucasus. They, they, these two powers have been at war on and off for 500 years at this point. In the early 600s, mutinies break out and uh, the Byzantine that's supposed to be army uh, leading to civil war among rivals for the throne, Persia uses the opportunity to invade Armenia and Mesopotamia. So an emperor arrives on the scene in the Byzantine world, Heraclius, the next of the great Basileus, the next great emperor of, of Byzantium, of Constantinople, and he's opposed by the king of kings, Khosrow II, the Shah and Shah, the king of kings, uh, who has aspirations to control uh, all the way to the Mediterranean, if he can get there. Persian armies have great success in Anatolia, what we would call Turkey today, but there were no Turks there then. Uh, and they launch an attack on Syria and managed to sack Antioch the great Christian capital of Antioch. In 614, Persian army with Jewish, Avar, and Slav allies sacked Jerusalem. Christian churches are burned. Numerous relics, the true cross, are looted. And 100,000 Christians are either executed or taken as slaves. And as you can well imagine in Christian lore, the Jews take the blame which will uh, result in, as we will see, a later bloodbath. Uh, and this, by the way, of all the, the bad blood and anti-Jewish propaganda within Christian circles that will take hold in the Middle Ages and into the early modern period, are probably traceable to these events and the wars between Byzantium and Persia. First, this bloodbath of Christians in 614. We'll get back to this. In 617 to 22, the Persians take Chalcedon, uh, Egypt, uh, with the aid of disaffected monophysites, as we might expect, some Greek islands, and they threaten Constantinople. So Khosro is even sends this, this supercilious letter, which may be apocryphal, to Heraclius. Khosro, greatest of gods and master of the earth, to Heraclius, his vile and insensate slave, why do you still refuse to submit to our rule and call yourself a king? Have I not destroyed the Greeks? You say that you trust in your God. Why has he not delivered out of my hand Caesarea, Jerusalem, and Alexandria? And shall I not also destroy Constantinople? But I will pardon your faults if you submit to me. So Byzantium strikes back. In the next few years, Heraclius makes a comeback. He debases the currency. He raises taxes, so he raises money. Uh, and with the help of the church, he rallies volunteers for a Christian crusade. And he defeats the Persian armies in the Persian heart, heartland. He takes the armies into Persia. While he's doing that, some forces of Khosrow 
with an army of Avar and Slav allies, try to siege Constantinople, and they greatly outnumber the troops that are left to, to defend the walls. According to chroniclers, morale was high because the patriarch led processions along the wall with the icon of the Virgin Mary, inspiring the belief that the Byzantines were under divine protection. And so it's hard to see here, but there is a procession to Mary on the walls during the siege of Constantinople. There is a final victory. He allies with Turks from the Caucasus, Heraclius does, and wins a great battle in Asia at Nineveh. All lost land is recovered. It was much more involved than this, but I'm summing it up. An indemnity is imposed on Persia. Relics are restored. The true crosses marched back into Jerusalem. And in retaliation for what happened in 614, there is a Christian slaughter of Jews in Jerusalem. And, and arguably, uh, what the, the great diaspora of uh, Palestinian Jews, not into Asia, a lot of that had happened already, but, but the movement northwards into the Caucasus, eventually becoming the Ashkenazi, might be traceable to these events and the wars between the uh, Byzantine and Persian empires uh, in the early seventh century. So what are the consequences? Persia is shattered, just shattered, a shell of itself. If Justinian had not left Byzantium compromised enough, the wars with Persia under Heraclius complete the set, as does the plague, as does the, the um, heavy taxation that imposed by Heraclius to fight the latest war. So the allegiance of the provinces to the empire are further weakened by Persian occupation, and the region is set, as my final remark, for the rise of Islam. When the armies of the Bedouins rise up and invade the territories once controlled by Persia and by Byzantium, the provincial territories of each, the homeland of Persia, there is no resistance. And it wasn't that these armies were so incredibly overwhelming, but this is, this is to be our topic for next week. We're going to look at Muhammad and the rise of Islam. So with that, I am going to stop the share. I am going to, if I can find me, I'm going to unpin myself. And go to gallery view and while you are all still here, I thought everybody would run for the hills. <laughs> are there, um, I see, wait, there must have been some more chats. Ah, so Lori has asked, in, in the Roman history class, I, we learned about uh, various cults in Zoroastrianism, how did the early Middle Age leaders quash all of those threads? Well, in the Byzantine world, it was the imposition of orthodoxy with an aggressive hand. Islam permitted it all for the longest time. And so a lot of those threads will stay, and it's something I'll talk about next week, will stay alive in the Islamic world going forward for a while. And we'll see what's meant by this. In the um, Latin West, 
those threads don't really exist. What you wind up with in the Latin West is the tug of war between uh, the various animist traditions that the Germans bring with them and the monastic traditions that are being promulgated. But the, the old underground Roman paganisms of one kind or another don't infect the West nearly as much. But Lou, and, Lou yes. what about all those wonderful gods? All of the wonderful gods. The, the, the Greek and Roman gods. Yes. yes, they're gone. They're gone. They're gone. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll say this much. They're displaced by saints. Using the principle of Dulia, using the principle that there can be an intercessor among, if you will, the uneducated, what would have been the cult worship of the god of the fountain or the god of the stream becomes the patron saint of the fountain or the patron saint of the stream or the patron saint of the place. Uh, St. Patrick is driving out snakes. We don't need a Medusa anymore. Uh, we, we are, God's, say, one of the reasons you find in, in Mediterranean Christianity, this heavy duty identifications of, of saints with what you think of as old Roman cults of one kind or another is because they are exactly that. They've been co-opted for the purpose. It was, it was the way uh, Latin-based peasantry would perceive um, their access to God. It's the way they always had their access to the gods. So the gods still exist, in effect, but they've been transmuted. They've been made these into these relics. This is why we want to be near the blood of San Gennaro. This is why we want to be able to, to kiss the reliquary around Mary Magdalene's alleged skull. This is, this is why... Uh, two of the people on the call um, were with us when we visited uh, the Lateran, St. John Lateran in Rome, and they had stumbled into the baptistry where there's a staircase and found locals crawling up the staircase on their knees so that they could kiss the top step. They they wanted to physically be near the sacramentum, the holy thing. So in effect, the gods still exist, but they don't exist as large abstractions. They don't need that. They've got Christian theology for, or, or Judeo-Christian theology for the large abstractions. Great the explanation, God, thank, you. thank you. Okay. How many I crusades think, were, were there actually? Say that again? How many crusades were there actually? I thought there were a number of them and they went into the, maybe the uh, 13 or 1400s? Yeah, uh, they go into the thir early 13th century, but we haven't even got, that's really the, what we call the crusades as such is a topic that I'm leaving to the following class to this course because they begin about where this course ends. I'm, I've, I've arbitrarily said this one's going to cut off at uh, 1100. And the first Western European crusade into Byzantium and the Holy Land takes place in 1096. Okay, so well, you did talk about the crusades in the 600s, I guess. The yeah, that, yeah, yeah, he calls it, it literally means uh, in Italian, it's the crociata. It literally means the war for the cross. And, and so anything we called a crusade, but what we formally call the crusades I see. I are, see. are the ones of the Latin church between 
1096 and 1205. Okay, thank you. Anyhow, anybody else? Yeah, Lou, um, I remember reading in Latin class, you know, Caesar and his battles, and who exactly were the Helvetii and where did they come from? They were, they were a, an early German tribe that merged into, at one point, a lot of the German tribes that came up against the Roman garrison borderlands along the, the Rhine and Danube in the heyday of the early empire, they were so far outnumbered because they were the early arrivals. This is long before the, the larger scale incursions of, of Goths, let's say. They were much smaller in, in scale and many of them then decided that they had to join forces. And this is very interesting. I believe the Helvetii were one of the groups that joined into the confederation that called themselves the Alemanni later on using uh, all men, the German for all men. Isn't it what the French still call the Germans, the Alemanni? Um, and adopt a new set of gods. They decided all their own local god traditions had failed them. So they sort of re reinvented new versions of Woden and Thor and Odin and called themselves the Alemanni. But I believe that's where the Helvetii disappeared. For those people who had to translate, all Gaul is divided into three parts. <laughs> a long time ago. So Anyhow. Can I, I'd like to ask a question. It's Miriam Schmier. Please. Hi. So I was interested in talking about the scriptoria that um, we refer to monks. And uh, I've heard that there were also women in the convents who were doing- Scribes, copy, yes. Copying and also illuminating. And I was yes. in, in the little um, miniature that you showed, the illumination at the very beginning in one of your early slides, there were people sitting doing copying. And it looked right. to me like one of the people, the one on the far right was a female figure. Do, do you have any sense of that? I didn't, you know, I hadn't even noticed that. I, I think it would have been very unlikely that they would have been men and women in the same scriptorium. Right. I think I think there would have been women in the convents and you know men in the 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 the, the, the monasteries. But um, yeah, there would have been noble women trained. It, it was a very highly educated enterprise. Basically, uh, there were two versions of it. One, one version was the the one-to-one the -one copy in which somebody would be given a manuscript and create almost the way Torah is done, I suppose, and are, are, are created. And then they would have been um, copied from a copy that one was looking at. But later on, when they when there was great demand, when the monastic movement I'm, uh, this is something, by the way, it's a topic that I'm, I'm touching on in one of the future sessions. I see. Uh, but there, when the monasteries are burgeoning, when the Cluniac order is establishing a thousand monasteries in a century, and these places need texts for all the standard stuff that each monastery is supposed to have, um, to go with them as they establish a new house, as they found a new house, what they would do to make sure they could produce copies fast enough is have a reader who would have the one copy and read out loud to five or six or 10, depending, uh, copyists who would then write down what they were listening to. And of course, this means that a tremendous amount 
of errors were <laughs> introduced, and and which is why there is this um, modern discipline of philology by which people compare manuscripts to figure out which ones were being copied from which other ones, and they could figure that out by which mistakes were promulgated from one to the next, um, and and so they could build a tree of manuscripts to try to figure out what was the original version of this that people first started copying from. Uh, and it's an arduous, I know somebody who actually does this for a living <laughs> and, and it's an arduous enterprise. Um, but that being said, uh, there were convents that did produce um, manuscripts and illuminations and these were, I believe more common in the German Benedictine houses that you will have under the uh, the Empire of the Great in the 10th and 11th centuries in Germany. But I'll try to find out more about that. And I will check, and I'll have more pictures of Scriptoria. I'll check to see if that really is a... I can't believe they did that because it, it would have been. Well, they were the, dub, the double monasteries. They were later, you know, but. Yeah, yeah, they were double, but I don't know that they would have used the same script because you had the principle of, of um, clausura, the, the cloister, uh -huh. uh, meant that a person from the opposite gender couldn't cross certain lines mm -hmm. unless the scriptorium was outside of the clausura, which maybe that's possible. <laughs> so. Thank you. Okay. So gang, next week, uh, we, we meet Muhammad next week and family. Have a good one.